Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Citroen Center event, which I really look forward to because I think the purpose of this small unit is to uh, encourage understanding of public opinion and political culture. And so this topic is central about how do we know what public opinion is. And uh, I welcome everyone here, a very distinguished set of speakers. Uh, their long, semi-long bios are here, but I'm gonna quickly say a word or two about everybody. Uh, the author of this book, Strength in Numbers, is sitting up there, Elliot Morris, who is certainly the youngest speaker ever uh, at one of our events in the last five years. So he's a child prodigy of some sort and has published and he has published this interesting book called Strengths in Numbers about how polls work and why we need them. He's a big part of the book is a commentary on what role polls can and should play in democracies. And I think that's an important topic in and of itself. And then given that, we need good polls and correct polls or, you know, properly conducted polls. And the rest of the book interspersed with some interesting history of polling, the role of people like George Gallup and others is a comment and a set of uh, recommendations about what Lenin said many times, what is to be done? And so what is to be done and to come? And so his uh, background very briefly, he's the staff data journalist and US, US correspondent for The Economist. And his primary responsibility there is the newspaper's coverage of elections and public opinion polls, inclined, included designing and um, building polling aggregators and election for forecasting models for both American and international elections. He is a graduate of the University of Texas in Austin, and he grew up in Texas in an interesting part of the state where his father was uh, involved in boating and fishing industry and still is for that matter. Uh, so that's Elliot. And now the discussants who are all significant players in the polling world. In one way or another, I'm going to start with Mark DiCamillo. He's an old friend and colleague of mine. We've known each other for many, many years, worked together closely. He's presently the director of the Berkeley IGS poll, which is a statewide survey of California public opinion conducted by the Institute of Governmental Studies here at Berkeley. And before that, Mark's career was with Field Research Institute and the Field Poll, California Poll. My wife is pointing at me to speak into the mic, so I always obey her. Um, this is why I usually don't let her come, but she decided to come. <laughs> That's how it is. But anyway, Mark joined the, in 1978, he joined the Field Poll and worked with the legendary pollsters, um, Mervyn Field. And then Mark took over the directorship of the poll. Merv was still in the background, right, participating, but Mark ran the show till 2016, where sadly, or field research disbanded or ended, and then everyone at Berkeley was fortunate, and we were really fortunate every single day that Mark decided to join Cal campus and run the IGS survey. So next, I'm going to look at right in front here is Aaron Hartman, who is a colleague or I'm emeritus, but nonetheless, a colleague. She's assistant professor, political science at the University of California, Berkeley. And her research sits, as it says here, at the intersection of the social sciences and statistics. And her mission, kind of serious mission here, Aaron, is to create a body of research that bridges the two worlds with an emphasis on answering causal questions within which experts from both worlds can have a dialogue with each other. And she um, has a background in the polling world too. I remember very well when Erin uh, left uh, her graduate education here to go and become the polling, uh, what was your title there? 
polling uh, director of the polling operation for Obama for president in 2012, and she went to Chicago analytics department. And uh, at the time, Eric, you don't know this, there's a lot of betting among the people at the IGS as to, will Erin ever return? Will she get her PhD? Will she abandon the academia for the world of politics? But fortunately, she didn't. Uh, although in this book, on page 123, Bar Barack Obama's secret weapon. Aaron Hartman is the unrecognized whiz kid of Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. She revolutionized the way campaigns conduct their pre-election polls. So what more do we need to say beyond that, you know? Uh, anyway, welcome, Aaron. Um, so finally, uh, John Cohn, who's the research chief research officer, senior vice president of strategic partnerships at Momentum, comma, in brackets, Survey Monkey, which is why uh, we, we it's, I think Survey Monkey is widely, widely known, widely, widely used. And John has used emerging technologies to gather quality unbiased data and analyze results. In 2020, he was named New School Poster by the National Journal as one of 50 people changing the game in Washington. Okay, awesome. John is well known to us at Berkeley too because he uh, was a graduate student here and got his MA before deciding to move into the polling world full time. He started with PPIC, then he was the director of polling for the ABC Washington Post poll before joining Survey Monkey and revolutionary revolutionizing what they do. So these are real experts here, Elliot, and they're gonna comment on the topics that you raised in your book. And so I'm not gonna turn it over to you. Welcome. I was gonna say, it's kind of a, it's kind of a blessing. My wife's not here to force me to talk into the microphone. So um, thanks for the generous introduction, Jack. Uh, it's really great to be here. I got in yesterday, I'll tell you a little anecdote before we talk about the polls. Um, I flew into SFO, which I didn't know is like an hour away from here by car in the middle of rush hour. Um, so which means I had to talk a lot to my Uber driver, partly because he wanted to talk a lot to me and I am from the South. So I don't like to not talk to people. Um, and he was like, so what are you in town for? So I explained to him, oh, I'm a journalist who covers polls. And he said, you like it right off the bat. He was like, oh, I don't like the polls. I don't trust them. I don't answer the polls when people call, which I gather is actually not that popular. Um, and we can see some charts about that in a second. Um, but unfortunately for him, he was stuck in the car for an hour with me. So he had to hear me re rehearse this talk for him for the next hour. But luckily for y'all, the talk is slightly, uh, slightly rehearsed. Um, so we're going to talk about why, and let me start a timer real quick, why the polls were wrong in 2016 and 2020 and what it means to be wrong when you're a pollster and how we can sort of think about the state of the industry uh, before 2022. And that's what the slides are on, mainly the how polls work part of the book, partly because I think that's more interesting to an audience like this. It's partly because it's more relevant right now. Um, but unfortunately, that means we don't talk a lot about the second part of the subtitle, which is why they matter. Um, and you know, we spend a lot of time at the beginning, or I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the book talking about that. So I'll give you a little bit of a spiel. I don't think that many of you are at the point in your career where you will go into polling if you aren't already into polling. Um, but I think it's important for us to sort of remember why um, this entire conversation about how polls are working is more important than in the election forecasting contest or context. Um, and you know, if you've read the book or if you're going to read the book, the first half is really a discussion of what public opinion really means, why it's important in a democracy um, and what it accomplishes. And there's, you know, there's lots of examples from American history um, that we go through from presidents who pay attention to the polls, um, to other legislators who cite the polls, maybe it's in a fundraising email, maybe it's in a news release, or before that you had at the beginning of the public polling industry, lots of interviews from political scientists with congressmen in which they would say, 
yeah, I really want to know what my constituents think. And we know from other research that that's partly because of the electoral connection between the two, but also there seems to be a sort of democratic spirit among people who want to represent other people in their government. Um, so this conversation about how to have accurate tools, mainly of election prediction, is really full of a lot of other lessons for why this whole enterprise is valuable to democracy. Now, I expect I'm preaching to the choir here, but maybe for the people who are online, um, I think it's that's important context for this. So we're going to talk about this book that I am the author um, and, and about how polls work. But before we talk about polls, I want to talk a little bit about soup. And I want to talk about soup because it's something that pollsters, it's an example that pollsters use quite often to explain as a starting point how polls get conducted. What is exactly going on when we say, you know, the art and science of sampling a larger population or trying to represent people. Um, and this example comes directly from the Pew Research Center. It's also what the statistician and mathematician Jordan Ellenberg, who's a professor at, at UW-Madison, calls the soup principle, which I think is really fun. So we're going to use his terminology of the soup principle to teach how sampling works. Um, and this is an important basis for us to later understand what's gone wrong with the polling. So the soup principle or example of polling goes something like this. When you're making a pot of soup, you like take out, in my case, always a th thing of Campbell's tomato soup and you dump it into a pot. And then maybe I add some herbs depending on how I'm feeling or like maybe some cheese. Um, and you bring it to a boil or a simmer and you let it sit there until it's totally homogenous. And you are, when you're ready to like eat the soup or you wanna know how it tastes, you dip a spoon in it and you taste it. And if that spoonful is good, then you decide then therefore the whole pot is good because you've stirred it because it's homogenous because your sample of the soup is a good representation of the larger population. And so that's the soup principle of polling. In polling, let's say in the early days of polling, uh, man on the street interviews, and mainly they were men on the street, you would um, you know, ask a couple people in your spoonful, assuming that they're representing the broader population, um, and that's the theoretical basis for polling today. If this condition, the soup principle is satisfied, then you have maybe a well-designed poll or something that can work in theory. And we're going to talk about how these assumptions kind of break down um, and, and maybe how to establish a type of sampling that might not be soup, but still works for the broader democratic purpose here. Um, and let's take a little journey before we get there and talk about how we came to the modern era of political polling. Um, and the first polls were straw polls, what we, we call them today, but really at the time they probably didn't use the word straw or the, or the word poll for that matter. Um, this is a funny example. I don't imagine there was lots of yelling, although it's politics and so maybe there was. Um, but the first example we have of polling comes in the, the 1824 election um, when a newspaper in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, sent out interviewers to random gatherings of military musters, of 4th of July parades, and simply tasked what was then basically reporters to send the editor of the newspaper back a tally of what people said. Um, and these first straw polls are called straw polls because they're not very scientific, right? Like that is not the science of sampling soup. There's lots of bias in where you go, who you talk to. There's no contro controls over the type of demographics uh, of the people you're talking to. And there's no guarantee that it's representative. Now, in fact, the Harrisburg poll was pretty accurate. The 1824 election in Pennsylvania, the popular vote was like 73% or so for Andrew Jackson. And this one poll was like 70-ish percent, but it underestimated support for other candidates, which uh, is a very familiar lesson these days. Straw polls are also, of course, famous for the literary digest failure of the literary digest straw poll in 1936, over 100 years later. We're skipping a lot of the really interesting history of smaller straw poll operations in between. So we're going from the like, very first, I don't know, maybe this is what the interviewer looked like, example um, of a very small sample of a couple hundred people to what was at the time thought to be a surefire way to sample the population, a poll of over 10 million people on the sample. 2 million people responding nationwide, in which um, uh, the margin in this poll, after like months of gathering data, 
was uh, 24 percentage points for the Republican in the election, Alf Landon. Um, in an election where the Democrat, Franklin Roosevelt, ended up winning by 24 percentage points. I'm sorry, it's, it's 14 percentage points for the poll, which is a 38 percentage point, if you're counting, error on this poll, which is probably, if we were taking count of all the straw polls ever conducted and the polls that we have today, probably the worst poll ever. Um, and like, that's an empirical statement. Um, and, uh, and so in 1936, this failure is predicted, of course, by George Gallup and some of his colleagues. Um, and this is the cover of the magazine that the Digest runs the week after the, the election. Uh, and subsequently, they sort of close their doors very, um, the magazine shuts down a few years later. Um, so this failure catalyzes a, you know, basically a scientific, and it's going to be in quotes from here on out, revolution in polling, in which these methods of convenient sampling and of sending millions of people postcards to mail back the surveys is understood to be faulty um, for, uh, for a few reasons. Mainly, the types of people you're getting back are no guarantee to be representative of the population as a whole. Um, so to fix that problem, people like George Gallup, people like Elmo Roper and Archibald Crosley do what we call quota sample polls, um, where instead of mailing a postcard to everyone on some list of people, maybe in the case of the digest, it's people who own telephones uh, or have an automobile, um, you send out postcards or interview them on the street of different demographic groups. So you make sure, say, if the electorate is 70% white, then your sample is 70% white ahead of time. Um, and these quota controlled face to face interview polls are much better than the community samples uh, of the straw poll era. Uh, and of course, in 1936, George Gallup is the victor in the sort of Gallup versus literary digest war. I should note his poll is also pretty wrong. It has Franklin Roosevelt only winning by 12 points. So it's like a 12 point error. I don't know, like, if y'all are keeping track, but the last polling error in the United States was two percentage points. Like I can't even imagine having this conversation in the context of a 12 percentage point error in the national polls, but we'll set that aside for now because it's pre-scientific really. It's an early sci an early example of scientific, um, scientific polling. Um, but of course that also has its pitfalls. We learned in 1948 that the quota controls are not perfect because there's still the chance that the type of people you're getting in those demographic quotas are biased politically. So in the case of the 1948 surveys, there's evidence of non-response by political group. So if you favored Harry Truman, for example, in the early polls, you were less likely to answer the survey than if you were a supporter of Thomas Dewey. So that's how we get this famous image, of course, of Harry Truman holding up the Chicago Tribune like the night or the day um, after the election they had pre-printed based off of the polls. Um, and after that defeat, it's not necessarily clear what to do from there. Quota controlled polls had been around since the early 30s. It was a natural sort of innovation of the scientific pollsters, not necessarily their own invention. Uh, but a group of academics, political scientists, sociologists have an answer. They say the Social Science Research Council says, instead of talking to people everywhere in the country, split up the country by county or by regions in a state and talk to people in those regions in proportion to their actual, their actual share of the population. That way you get, say, the right share of people from Southern Ohio or, uh, or the right share of people from South Houston. I'm from Texas, so here's a city kind of close to me in Texas. Um, or you can even go one step further and slice up the country uh, or your sampling unit, maybe it's, maybe it's by county, into groups by past vote choice. And so you get the right share, not only of um, women and younger people, but also of Republicans and Democrats, at least in your sample. Um, and Gallup runs with this idea. And in 1952, his polls aren't nearly as bad as they are in 1948, um, but they're still not perfect. Um, there's a problem with this and that if you're doing a face-to-face -face poll, there's still bias from the interviewer that could be someone assuming someone has certain demographic characteristics or not interviewing someone because of their demographic characteristics. So some troubling examples from Elmo Roper's polling operation where people aren't doing polls in black parts of New York, for example. Um, and it's not necessarily as scientific as we would want it to be. We want 
the data collection to be as systematic as possible. So having people do interviews on the street is not necessarily um, as systematic as it needs to be. And so in the 1970s, we have what I guess we can call the third phase of scientific polls. And that's the invention of, of random digit dialing on cell phones. Um, so uh, you have, you know, in 1971, Warren Matosky invents this program basically for randomly sampling cell phone numbers and or landline phone numbers and calling them randomly, which is a lot cheaper. Um, it's more systematic and ushers in what we might call a golden age of, of polling, where 70 to 80 percent of people are answering their phone calls. We have lots of different news organizations conducting polls um, and where if you have systematic collection and lots of people answering your polls, then in theory, there's less space for the types of people answering your polls to be less biased. And again, that's only really um, in theory. Uh, but this golden age is better than the previous age. This graph shows absolute error in polls from 1936 through 2016. It's from um, the American Association of Public Opinion Research. Um, and you can see right around here that the absolute error predicting national vote margin for president is about three percentage points on average, which is a dramatic improvement from the early sort of pre-scientific era of data collection. And so we come to this point in about the 1990s where we have a systematic mode of data collection, where we have quota controlled polls or the emergence of corrections, weighting adjustments for surveys, to make sure that they're representative also along demographic groups or uh, along demographic lines. Um, and where you have lots of different survey houses publishing public polling results. Um, and in, there was no one doing this, but in theory where you could aggregate those results and have a pretty good estimate of the true shape of public opinion in America or in certain states. And so um, is this good polling is sort of the question. Have the pollsters in 1990 satisfied this soup principle? There's lots of people to be maybe in the melting pot in the soup for them to sample. Um, there's lots of sampling going on. Um, the polls are pretty representative. Like, like I said, there's still errors in vote choice, but they're not nearly as large as they were before. And errors tend to bounce around from year to year as pollsters are sort of fighting the last battle. Um, and there's lots of different sort of methods going on under the hood of how those corrections happen and how the sampling of the poll uh, goes on. So like maybe in 1990, you think the polls are gonna be, are gonna be perfect um, forever, but that's not the case. So um, just as technological change with the phone led to better polls, uh, it also seems to us had to have sabotaged the pollsters later on because an adoption of phone polling on the landline collides with a adoption of cell phones and decline in the willingness of people to talk to pollsters. Maybe that's because the pollsters aren't as accredited as they used to be, or there's not as many news organizations being polls or, or whatever it may be. Um, this is a profound problem. So instead of having 70 to 80% of people answering your poll, like it was in the 70s to 80s, by the turn of the century, maybe 30% of the people you call are answering the phone. And you know, by 2018, that was 6%. It's even lower today, maybe 4 to 5% if you're the Pew Research Center, which is producing this graph, and probably a lot less if you're a different pollster without the type of resources they have. Um, and that poses a really severe blanket objection to whether or not the polls are satisfying this suit principle, whether or not they are on the face representative of America, because you're not getting a representative sample. You're getting one out of every 100% hundredth person answering your phone, talking to you about politics. And maybe you can force that group to be demographically representative, but those people, and I'll use a statistical term here, are weirdos. Like they want to talk to you about politics. They're really engaged in politics. They you know, have attitudes about things that you wouldn't expect random people on the street to have attitudes about. And that presents, again, pl a blanket violation of the soup principle. Sampling also gets harder in this period. You have more polarization by political groups in America. So black, white, education, educated, uneducated, uh, America by region are all having more polarized voting behavior, which means you have to sample every single group to make sure it adds up to the right share. Well, in theory, that it adds up to the right um, share, uh, uh, the, you know, the right outcome in, in election results. Um, and 
that is <laughs> that that's bad that's very bad for polling um by you know 2005 or so it's very clear that polls aren't representative of the population under the hood even if they're coming up with pretty good election return uh predictions maybe on average um and we have seen i think recently how this breaks down in really close elections when people have very high expectations for the polls to provide predictive accuracy, laser-like election forecasts. Um, and and it, it really just doesn't work. So what looks in theory to be a sampling of tomato soup, we might think of as actually a minestrone soup, a sampling where you have to, <laughs> in your spoon, have like a piece of pasta and cucumber and like tomato all in the same bite, or you're not getting a true representation of the whole soup to bastardize the soup principle metaphor one step further so polls are not soup today they're we should not think of them as meeting criteria for random sampling so then therefore how do you have a good poll what is the way forward um, from there and these are just a summary of the problems so far um, oh thank you so to satisfy this soup principle what pollsters turn to is making a lot of statistical adjustments to their sample um, they turn to weighting their samples to make sure they're demographically representative. They start modeling their data. They'll run huge regressions over tens, hundreds of thousands of interviews to predict how people in tiny demographic categories are likely to behave or to believe and then add up those predictions um, into what are thought to be representative surveys. And again, while you can come pretty close, this is not like theoretically sound, well-designed surveys, not because people aren't trying, but because the original conditions of polling haven't been met. And so, yeah, they're pretty good, but are the pollsters doing things the right way? Um, and sort of more profoundly, can this provide the type of thing we are expecting from the polls in elections that are 49, 51, maybe that's nationally, but especially at the state level where national elections really seem to matter today, can these, you know, not broken, but battered instruments do what we want them to do, measure the will of the people. And recent elections, I think, have shown the public, and we probably disagree with this, that they can. And people don't trust the polls because of this. I mean, part of the reason is because there's non-response within demographic groups that people aren't adjusting for. And maybe we like to think if they were just doing it the correct way, then these surveys would be representative. But as later elections like 2020 have shown us, even within those groups, even if those groups are represented by, you know, by their race or by their education, you're still not getting the right political composition of those groups. And that's a much harder problem to solve. That's not something that you can solve with a weighting algorithm because there's no official statistic for the share of Republicans in the electorate. There's definitely not a statistic for the share of white voters that are Republican and on and on. And um, and there's um, and there's problems further of reaching the right type of Republican, even if you can fix the survey. Um, so we know that even among pollsters who were adjusting for partisanship, for example, in 2020, they didn't have the right like intensity of Republican responding to their surveys. So that might sound like a pretty bleak prognosis, but there is, I think, a solution. There's, first off, some promising methodological um, progress being made. That's being made by online pollsters who can run a lot more sophisticated algorithms to try to satisfy these conditions of representativeness within political representativeness within demographic groups. And there's some guessing involved in that process, but it's better, I think, than not doing those adjustments at all. Um, there's a shift to using more weighting variables in mainstream surveys that previously wouldn't have done this, even making sure you have the right share of previous Trump voters in your poll goes a long way to not doing that. And some pollsters are making progress there. Um, there's shifts to conducting polls um, via mail again, a sort of old polling method brought back. There's SMS text data collection. Um, and there's essentially a promising way for pollsters to meet people where they are. If they're not talking to you over the cell phone, 
if you can't ensure that the convenient samples you're getting online are representative, then what do you do? You can be really smart with your modeling. You can try to find them in the earlier sampling or what we call the design phase of the poll and try to have a better starting ground. Try to have something that more resembles the tomato soup um, than, um, than, what we have, uh, than what we have today. But also I think the solution here might be to expect less of the pollsters, frankly. Um, I think we've gotten in the habit of expecting election predictions to provide us uh, really close elections with on average correct predictions of the winner of those elections. Um, and even with an accurate survey, uh, it can't provide us with a type of probabilistic predictive accuracy that consumers of election predictions and polls today um, have come to expect. So that's why in my book, I argue essentially for tempering down your expectations for what the polls can tell you. And in this case, ahead of November, um, individual surveys I review in the book have margins of error because of all these problems that are about twice as big as we've come to expect. Um, and even when they're aggregated, um, if you have violations of partisan response rates being equal in your sampling phase of your poll, you're gonna have biases later on. Um, so that sets us up for a test, I think, of polls this year. Are the increases in the number of pollsters using more weighting variables going to decrease at, uh, uh, errors in election polling? Are the benchmarking surveys that pollsters are doing over mail going to increase the overall representation, representativeness of surveys because they're weighting to political variables from those high response rate surveys? Are the private pollsters making developments like mixed mode polls where you combine telephone and online data collection into the same survey going to have sort of spill off effects for public pollsters who are adopting their methods? Um, and will polls provide us with something that's still useful at the um, end of the day? And if that doesn't work, I suggest asking a second question, which is what do we have if that doesn't, if that doesn't work? If we can't trust polls for predicting election outcomes to the 99th percentile, then what are they good for? And to totally hawk my wares here, that's what the second half of the book is about. And that's what we can talk a little bit more about in today's panel. So that's the book. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, it was pretty clear from this presentation that the central issues seem to be representative sampling on the one hand and um, compounded by lowering response rates and uh, that certain kinds of people are less likely to be willing to answer questions and the focus recently has been of you know people who are supporters of Trump they're either not found or they're not willing to respond or if they do respond which I think is controversial are they unwilling to say they're really for Trump because that was somehow in some remote way get them disfavored by this person or online figure who is uh, asking the question. So these are the sort of contemporary issues. And so now we have Mark DiCamillo who has innovated in uh, sampling among other things. And so Mark, turn it over to you. Always good to be here, Jack. Jack is really one of the reasons I'm at Berkeley. I am very grateful to him after Field's demise. And uh, first, uh, you know, I did find Morris's book to be uh, a an interesting compilation of the origins and history of polling. I got a, a little insights into some of that uh, I didn't have before, but the parts that were of greatest interest to me were the parts that were coinciding with my 40 plus years of career in polling. And because of that, I'd like to use some of my time to just review the changes in methods that I've used over the course of my career in, in response to some of the problems that uh, uh, Elliot was, was mentioning. And to do this, I'm dividing my uh, polling career, my public polling career into three phases. The first phase uh, began in the late 1970s and it was the age of random digit dialing. It was just coming into the fore and Mervyn Field at Field had already started random digit dialing. So those were my first experiences with hands-on polling were actually without 
door to door. It was random digit. Uh, it really was the golden age of polling because it lasted quite a many years. It lasted a number of decades. Uh, we did random digit dialing through pretty much the early 2000s. Uh, and in those days, as uh, uh, you know, it had a lot going for it. it you had all of these, uh, you know, large proportions of people having the same kind of uh, uh, a telephone, uh, the landline phones, uh, and people were responding and willing to do it. Uh, and it pretty much got us close to, you know, the goal of giving every household in the United States or in California, as I was doing it, an equal chance of being called. But by uh, the turn of the century, uh, you could start to see the problems mount for random digit dialing and uh, response rates were declining. Uh, people were turning away from the landline phone to use their cell phones. And what was clear in our polling was that the representativeness of the unweighted samples were going down and we needed to rely more and more on uh, the weighting aspect of polling. The, uh, this is basically raking post-stratification weighting where we would try to align our samples demog with the demographics to known population parameters of that population. Uh, and when interviewing larger uh, scale surveys, we also needed at the time to do two surveys, uh, actually random digit surveys of uh, landline users and random digit surveys of cell phone users and try to combine the two. Uh, but this came at really great cost. And uh, you know, for a state poll like ours, it's not really going to last very long unless you have uh, foundation support like maybe Mark Baldessari has. But uh, for me, uh, I started uh, this is what I would call the second phase of my career in, at polling. Uh, I moved away from random digit dialing and moved to uh, registration based sampling. It was still done by telephone, uh, but this is basically just sampling voters off of the voter rolls. This significantly improved our hit rate. In term and lowered our costs of doing the telephone polls. But it also gave me a great opportunity to uh, do further refinements with sample weighting because the vendors of our random digit or our uh, registration based samples had very detailed counts or could give me lots of detailed counts of registered voters on a wide, wider range of dem uh, demographic variables, but also on really important political dimensions such as party registration. We didn't have to rely on party ID. We had party registration in California. Plus a voter's history of voting was on the file. So you knew who the frequent voters were, certainly helped you out in determining who was most likely to vote. But after I left field in 2016 and came here the following year, I entered what I'm now considering my third phase of polling. Uh, UC gave me greater latitude to experiment with alternate forms of data collection in addition to what I'd been used to doing by telephone. And in my first year as director, I was uh, able to complete five large scale statewide surveys. One used a traditional RDD random sample uh, by telephone. Another did uh, the registration based sample uh, using the voter rolls. Two more were done using an opt-in panel of the electorate that we purchased, I believe from YouGov. And then a fifth was a more experimental approach which uh, we was somewhat in use at IG uh, at Berkeley, but I certainly uh, took it to another level by distributing email invitations to random samples of voters whose email addresses were appended to their voting record. Uh, basically, we're just instructing people in the email uh, that uh, you know you do the survey online by clicking on this link, uh, and they would then do a self-administered survey uh, of our poll. Uh, that was housed at IGS. It takes advantage, certainly one of the unique things about California is that a lot of voters have their email address appended to their voter record, which is a public record. Over 10 million voters now have that uh, on, on their voter file. And even in the course of the four or five years that I've been experimenting with this method, that's been going up by millions every year. So it won't be long before we'll have uh, even more. Um, but one of the things that troubled me in the early going of experimenting with the email method was that I soon realized that we needed to really make adjustments when drawing our samples since the response rates from the emails differed greatly by age and also by gender. Uh, younger voters certainly less apt to fill out or complete a survey with an email invitation. Women were less apt than men. Uh, 
And so when drawing our samples, what we ended up having to do, we stratified the random selection process. So we drew samples within each age range and within genders uh, so that more invitations would be sent out to the lower responding segments. Uh, fewer were being sent out to the higher responding segments, basically to retrieve in the end, a balanced sample of respondents with each poll. Um, you know, I've been doing polls in California now for 40 years, and I, I, I think the method that we're using now, I, I, I have pretty good confidence that we're getting reliable representations of the overall registered voter uh, sample. Uh, I want to, you know, give a few of the reasons why, what, what the advantages are of, of doing what we're doing. First, it's still using the independent random sampling methodology that I was born and raised on. We're not using panels. We're not recontacting participants from past polls. We're just doing a new fresh sample every time. And our polls, because they're done by email, have the capability of getting very large samples because it costs very little to send lots of emails out. Uh, a typical IGS poll now has over 8,000 registered voters. And this in turn, gives you a much greater uh, capability to do the weighting that is really necessary now, the, the very detailed sets of weights that we employ to, to get our samples of these 8,000 voters into conformity, not only at the statewide level, uh, which is what I was used to doing uh, with all my telephone polls, but now with the size of the samples we have, we actually um, weight to within each of eight separate regions of the state so that we're trying to refine uh, by party, by age, by gender, by ethnicity, uh, the characteristics within each of those regions. And it's, I think it's worked well. Uh, certainly our pre-election polls in the last few cycles, especially in the last recall election for Governor Newsom, uh, were pretty much right on the money. Uh, we're actually doing polling right now uh, for the LA Times in the LA's mayor's race, which is another uh, you know, advantage of having huge samples. We can oversample LA, which is what we're doing right now. And we're gonna be uh, going right up through election day, uh, polling in LA as well as statewide. But the method isn't perfect, obviously. No method's perfect these days. And I continue you know, to look for new ways to kind of make further refinements. Um, one idea, which has some promise, uh, we may be experimenting with it next year is to send uh, reminders to the non-responding voters via a text message. Uh, since the cell phone numbers of uh, most of the voters in California anyways are also on the voter file. Uh, and hopefully uh, that can uh, improve the response rates, especially among the younger voters, which uh, have been a particular problem for us. Um, in closing, you know, pollsters today face many challenges, and, and Morris's book is a, is a valuable addition to just bringing that back to life. Um, uh, it provides professionals with certain ideas about improving our methods, but I think more importantly, it's, it's an attempt to communicate to the media and to the public the limitations of polls and hopefully giving them some better means of evaluating them. So I applaud him for that. Uh, I also agree with... Uh, Certainly one of his uh, uh, recommendations or comments that uh, people who are consumers of polls should really discount or at least give less uh, credibility to uh, margins of error that are reported within each poll. Uh, all polling methods today stray considerably from the basic assumption that underlies sampling error formulas uh, because it presumes that everyone has an equal chance of being selected. Plus it doesn't account for all the stratification or all the the weighting that you're doing uh, on top of that, at least the simple formulas don't. Uh, and certainly there are many other forms of error besides sampling error. And you know that total error, which is what Morris is drawing his attention to saying the double it. Well, I'm not sure that that helps at all to double the sample. It just, it's a meaningless number in some ways. And I wish the media would move away from it, but it is what it is. People seem to need some kind of estimate of error in a poll. But I, I really don't think it helps when you have estimates of error that are pretty much using the same formula across every poll. What good is that? Uh, and also, I would just comment that I agree that uh, we need to start moving away from just the method of that has been in existence when I first started, that just doing telephone surveys uh, by in and of itself is sufficient. Uh, with the decline, declining response rates of the public uh, in, in answering phones or even just all the technology that uh, prevents people from not even getting calls. I think you really need multiple methods 
uh, if you're going to employ telephone or like our poll, you can just do away with it entirely. Thanks a lot. Okay. I am, I do not have, I, I had a, I think impactful, but a fairly brief time actually doing polling. Um, so I cannot, I cannot speak as eloquently to the, to the history of polling. Uh, and at Jack's request, uh, he said no, no equations. So strictly speaking, there are no equations in here because there are no equal signs. <laughs> so I wanna make four points, four points that came to mind reading this excellent book. Uh, first of all, not on this list, is this, I think this book is gonna be great. I struggle a lot to try to explain to a group of undergraduates why they should care about the math that I'm about to teach them. And I think this book does a really good job of, of stripping away that math and giving context and history and meaning to why we do polls and thus why we might want to study some of the math behind them. So I'm gonna make four points. One is what are the sources of polls? How do I, how, how have I learned about them? I think for many people in this audience, this will not be new, but it's uh, still a structure to think about errors in polls. Uh, I wanna talk as a researcher now, part of the reason I came back was to get to spend a lot of time thinking about how we're gonna solve some of these problems without the pressure of actually doing the polls um, on my back. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of things that I am doing uh, with my, my colleagues and, and with my students to try and move the field forward. And then and at the end, um, I wanna think about uh, kind of piggybacking on these great points that, that Elliot makes in his book, with, given this era we're in, how are we gonna move forward? So on page 172, and I think also at the beginning, um, Elliot says, pollsters should be open to the fact that their opinion polls are subject to roughly twice the potential error that is captured by traditional margin of sampling error. So there's a framework that I often appeal to to think about how, what, what, what is this other, you know, twice? So there's two pieces of a poll. We think first about measurement. So you can ignore the little math symbols. I just didn't have time to take them out. So we have some construct we're trying to measure. Who are you gonna vote for on election day? That's the thing we care about. But we actually have to figure out how to write a survey question to measure it. So we already have one source of error, validity, right? Is the thing that we measure actually capturing what we care about? Then we ask somebody to respond and they could have, the way we measure it could have error. And then, especially nowadays, they're online, we call them on a poll, we text them, we ask them to press one if they're going to vote for candidate A, we could get some sort of processing error. But then pollsters do a whole lot of work on the other side too, representation. We have to define our target population to run a poll. Who's going to vote on election day? We don't know that before election day. From that, we have to figure out how we're going to sample. So I think Mark covered all the bases, RDD, uh, we do a registration-based poll, but, so, but if we're, even if we're doing registration-based, what about all these new voters who can vote on election day and register on election day in Minnesota? How do you capture them? From our people we could possibly call, we can draw a sample, but they're not all gonna respond. We saw the declining response rates. I think I saw that Nate Cohn had a 0.47% response rate to his most recent poll on the phone. And then, so we are in this world where we do some sort of adjustment. We model or we wait. All of these seven circles are error. So all of that feeds into, at the end of the day, we get one survey statistic, one estimate. And when we purport a margin of error, we really are only talking about this one circle. So the other factor of two, I think is hard to quantify. I think it's great to think of a roughly two, but I actually don't know anybody who could tell you all these sources of error. Okay, so to point to what are we doing? Uh, can't solve the other seven sources of error, but I can helpfully, what we're trying to work on is adjustment. So Elliot pointed out, there's two ways that uh, pollsters typically adjust. So even with a little bit of information about people, survey adjustment is hard. If I know your age, gender, and education, and the attainment, I can wait on those things. But what about if I have a thousand characteristics about you from a voter file? So we typically take two approaches, survey weighting and modeling. And as Mark previewed nicely for me, we kind of think about two different ways of doing this, raking, by which I mean, we make this, the sample look representative on these margins, right? We make the number of women look right, we make the number of college educated look right, but we don't necessarily get that intersection. What about the number of college educated women? At the other end, if we could account for all of them, we call that post-stratification. That's more desirable, but it is less feasible. 
as you have more characteristics, you run out of data. You can't wait data you don't have. On the modeling side, we do simple, we kind of think of this from a simple models to complex models. So Drew Linzer is in the audience here and Elliot talks about his very complex dynamic Mr. P modeling. I didn't want to say they were less feasible. They are more desirable, but they are also more difficult to run. And they run into many similar problems. So we're thinking about these problems and a lot of my research focuses on the weighting. How do we parsimoniously find where to stop on this error, arrow? But it turns out we're also trying to push forward on another approach, which is how can we combine them? So how can we parsimoniously go across this whole box and try and find the sweet spot where we have, you know, complex enough models and complex enough weights Okay, I'm not a model-based person. You have an expert right behind you. But say we could run a simple model, right? That's just like a regression model to try and predict who somebody's going to vote for, right? Now it's going to be if we just include in our logit model a few factors, age, gender, and educational attainment, it's not, it'll be very precise, but it won't be accurate. So we might want to include more characteristics. We have a thousand characteristics and a thousand data points, it then becomes unclear how to do that. So we can make the model more complex in many different ways. We could account for time, interactions, um, more information, but it just becomes harder. So we can parsimoniously go across any of these dimensions. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is find that, that sweet spot in the middle, report back in a couple of years. <laughs> So as non-response gets worse, we need to know more and more about people to actually overcome this non-response problem. And that means we need to do more adjustment. And as we do more adjustment, data-driven methods are what help us solve this now, not only hard, but really hard problem. Point three, all models are wrong. So I just told you, we have to do all these models. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So as we rely on these models, um, I think, we need to acknowledge they are always oversimplifications of how people make decisions. And the question is, how are they useful? Um, and so the other branch in my research is thinking about ways to try and visualize um, and numerically assess how wrong could our models be before our conclusions are different. And so I'm not going to go into the details, although I'll happily talk to you about this paper. But the idea is, this was two polls. One was census household polls, one was Axios, Ipsos. So we're trying to estimate COVID vaccination rates about six months out from uh, when vaccine, vaccines started. And census household polls overstated it by about 15 percentage points. Axios was much closer. So we're trying to get tools that would allow you to see that without knowing the answer. So what the blue shaded region is trying to assess is how sensitive could these results be? How imbalanced would something that we forgot to include have to be before we are wrong? Right, so Elliot talked a lot about, we didn't wait on education, right? Well, we would see that if we had forgotten something like education in these weights, it actually would have changed our estimates in a substantively important way. And so these are the types of tools that I don't envision you reading about in the New York Times, but my hope is that pollsters will start to try and become real with themselves about what assumptions they're making and how to assess them and hopefully help us get more robust answers. So moving forward, unfortunately, I don't think data can solve all our problems, although it solves many. As respondents become more unrepresentative, I think we also need to elevate the knowledge of people who have a lot of subject area expertise, people who know their context really, really well. So there's some many examples I could point to, but just a couple. Ann Seltzer is very famous for being very good at polling Iowans and being pretty accurate and seeing things before some other people do. And part of that, in my assessment of what I've read from her, is that she knows Iowa well. She knows the data and the problems that crop up in those polls. Mark talked about knowing he's obviously an expert in, in polling California, talked a little bit about LA. There's another polling operation in LA by Shikari and Rodrigo Byerly. Shikari was a graduate student at UCLA when I was working there. And they focus almost exclusively on LA, but they also know a lot about then the context. And I think those people can do really good polls and we need to, to elevate what they know in thinking about how we then address our methods. And as I think comes across in the book, um, I think a message that I took, polling has not historically been a particularly diverse field, neither descriptively, but nor in, in the way that it 
uh, deals with new ideas. And I think that comes really well in your book is that every time somebody had a new idea, they face resistance. And so I think going forward, we need to be, think deep, look deep inside and, uh, and, and incorporate this diversity of perspectives and approaches as we go forward. And, and so I think Mark talked a lot about the, I think some of the ways that we move forward, Elliot talked about a lot of them. And so I think I would just would like to echo that point um, and say that I hope we I hope we are open to these approaches. John, you asked me if you could be the cleanup hitter here. And you know, since you've done so much for me, I acquiesced and yeah. you're on. Yeah. You have another couple hours, right, guys? We'll be good. Elliot, are you a Warriors fan? What's that? And the answer is? Ask this so often. The answer is no, apparently. <laughs> Strength in numbers is a trademark of the like Golden State Warriors. No. Um, but yes, okay. Warriors are awesome. Join the crowd. Uh, Jack mentioned uh, bets that were placed on Aaron's returning to graduate school when she left. He didn't mention any bets being placed when I left um, graduate school <laughs> as an ABD. I guess the answer was sufficiently clear um, to people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I, I really enjoyed the book. Thank you, Elliot, for writing it. Um, some amazing quotes, some of which that I've used in presentations myself. My favorite one was actually by a person I hadn't heard about in grad school or any time since, Tunis Wortman, who framed up public opinion as the ultimate triumph of truth. I love that one. So I'm going to steal that one. I'll quote you a few times, then I can drop that. Um, after that. Um, but the, I like the discussion of the golden era of polling and also all, everything that came before, because I think it's important to know that that golden era was pretty brief in retrospect. You know, I happened to you know, start polling in that era, so we can talk about that. But there was a before time and polls were important then for all kinds of reasons. And they're important now that we're no longer in that golden period. But I'm reminded a little bit of the trust in government literature where all the reference points, when everyone says trust in government's down, are to these few polls when trust in government was really high in a post-war era. Well, what about the Whiskey Rebellion? What about all the other times when you know, things were really shitty in this country? We have this one reference point. So kind of having this one reference point for polling is a bit of a misnomer, but it was a great era because we had a common definition of what made a good survey. And there was the, in that consensus, we could just argue the substance of the surveys. We happen to be in this really important time in American politics and we have to debate the math of the surveys. Like, I think that's a problem. And if we could agree on what made a good survey, we could have some sense of what the truth is and have cleaner arguments about what's happening in this political moment than the ones we're able to have, because we do have to debate math. No problem debating math, we can do it, but there's something more in polling. And Elliot makes a great point throughout the book on polls are important, not just for election predictions. In fact, there are all these reasons they're important. And so just because we get a couple elections wrong, big deal. Right? It's better to be right than wrong, but like that's not the problem. The problem is people don't believe the polls that matter for democracy, that matter for running organizations, that matter for all these things. If we can get back to that point, we would all be better off. It's a problem when Bob Groves, who was you featured in Aaron's slide deck before on total survey air, probably the world's foremost survey methodologist, currently the provost of Georgetown University, used to direct the census. The census is a survey with $20 billion of your tax dollars every decade. He doesn't have them. When he comes out and says he doesn't have much hope for surveys, that is a real problem. Like this, like, so in some ways, you understate the problem that we have. And it's because it's not just about election predictions. It's about everything. It's about what we know about ourselves. So this is a longer quote from him. I won't read it in detail. But he ends with, this is fixable, sort of. In many cases, ways it's fixable in the ways Aaron's described. It's fixable by bringing other sources of data, by lowering the respondent burden, you know, et cetera but it is horribly messy. And so I think we just have to really embrace the fact that this is messy. And as I said before, I think that's a problem. When I was at ABC News and the Washington Post, I wrote the polling standards. I wrote the polling standards, I conducted the polls that we did at those two news organizations. And I also wrote the standards by which we put, said what polls could make it into newsprint at the time, was more popular than it is now, but also into the pixels that were on air at ABC News. I had every confidence that we could write those standards well. We had to adjust them. I rewrote the standards in 2011 to include IVR polling, the automated um, message polls that you would get as opposed to a live telephone interviewer. That was hard to do. There was a lot of resistance to that across the polling community, but you had to do it. You could not adequately cover politics without covering IVR polls that had come, become more than half the polls. I do not know 
how to write polling. I would not know how to write polling standards today. And I'm going to suggest, you know, kind of at the end, what kind of some minimal things that we could agree on that we can get there. But I would like to get there. But it's not my declaring it. It's not Elliot declaring it or Aaron declaring it or Mark declaring it. We have to find where can we agree and how do we do it? So I, I appreciate the what, how do you make a good model? How do you assess a model? Because we need that. I'd benefit from it. Now, this Pew just put this out um, last week. Again, I think that's not fall for the uh, conflation of uh, polling and election predictions. They are very different. One assumes the other. Election predictions are built on top of the polls and they set the money line. It is useful. When I ran big polls at the Washington Post, you know, 45 question polls, I wrote, tried to write very nuanced articles. I often put the horse race down in the sixth or seventh paragraph, always came right back up. I would spend all day doing this. I'd come home. My wife, who's a brilliant Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, would say, who's winning? That is what people want. That is why Don Graham paid those bills. That is what motivates a lot of spending on surveys today. You cannot avoid it. At the same time, it's not the same thing as all of polling. And so to understand what's happening, Pew, which, you know, Elliot mentioned this, they have a lot of money. You can solve a lot of these problems that we've been discussing today with money. Now, that's an organization that has $40 million a year to spend on polling. Most companies do not. What they found is that you can actually do this well on a lot of the issues, right? So they went through a bunch of benchmarks that they have from are you a citizen to do you vape? And there are government statistics on these. Again, they come from polling, but sometimes those polls require, have mandated response. So you know the response rate is at least higher than the 0.4%. I saw that same thing Nate Cohn uh, said in Times yesterday. You know, that's amazing. But so these are the benchmarks. Sometimes they're pretty bang on. And it's with a combination of polling, online, offline, also, um, and the weighting that's involved. But you can do pretty well. You know, not, not throwing out the proverbial baby with the bathwater, which also you refer to in the book, is important to think about here. If you're polling on the issues, it still can work. It does require money. It does require attention and rigor and modeling, but it does work. So while things are on one hand worse than we advertised, they're not all lost. So that's important. There is a practice here and a skill behind it. So Elliot, you use the word way forward. I will as well. I do think we need theory. You know, another quote that I uh, often put up is by Cliff Zukin, who currently runs polling at the Pew Charitable Trust, which is the umbrella organization that the Research Center um, is affiliated with. A former Rutgers professor, former president of APOR. Um, Elliot mentioned APOR. Um, Cliff said that you've asked a bunch of APOR presidents why polling works. They would say, I have no idea. Right? You can't sit here in the academy and say, we don't know why it works. Oh, but it works. Like we will all benefit if there's a theory behind this. And that's the, the difference between design-based and model-based. You need a theory. We cannot live with a, we don't know why this works. Cause then you're with just trust us. And we know these days where we get with trust. We need short of theory or in addition to theory, we need those principles and standards. Pew has a set of practices. They have conducted that survey. They've created a panel. They do it online. There are all kinds of panel problems. We can have a whole academic you know, session on why not to believe panels. People who are part of panels are different. People aren't. Some of that you can model away. Some of it you can't. There are issues, but you need the principles and standards. And I sit here today, having told you I wrote them. I don't know how to write them. We have to come up with that together. And there, so there's currently an APOR and American Statistical Association joint task force on repairing the social climate for surveys. How many people have taken a survey in the last week? Yeah. How many people have refused to take a Jack, that's an excellent uh, corollary to my question, right? Th there's a problem when people are inundated with surveys. You know, I can talk about how we, I've done it as SurveyMonkey for nine years. It's not by, you know, kind of spamming strangers. It's because you get a survey from an organization that you're part of. That makes a difference. So like, we have to address this problem. We have to repair that social climate where people want to respond. That golden era of surveys was because, A, there was a list. There was a list of every home telephone number in the country, and, and people were willing to answer the phone when it rang. So there was a list and there was willingness. There is no list online anywhere. There's no list. And we know what about willingness. We just, we just saw a show of hands on that front. Like this is a problem, so we have to figure it out. Um, I will present to you an MVP. MVP in 
the collegiate context or any real world context means most valuable player. In the technology world, it's minimally viable product. What's the minimum that we need to start to agree on something? The number one thing I have here is scale. We you talked about it in the modeling context. Aaron said, you need a lot of data. Mark talked about, you know, kind of having 8,000 versus the thousand that you used to have. You know, I think it's a one big ass spoon for your soup, um, Elliot, to, to <laughs> pursue that analogy. The ladle, big ladle, right? You just need a lot of data. For you need it for the modeling. I felt that though in 2008. In 2008, actually 2007, sorry to take you the way back machine. You know, I was doing polling. This is before cell phones. You could do a, a legitimate landline sample of the US and feel really confident in it. We were the first poll in February of 2007 to show um, black voters, uh, de black Democratic voters moving from Clinton to Obama in that primary, right? Yeah. I got my years right. But so, and like, you know, this was a move that was anticipated, but Clinton, having been, you know, the spouse to the first quote unquote first black president, had a lot of support among black voters. But it shifted to Obama in that spring. We were the first national poll to show that shift. Dan Balls, who's the chief court, uh, political correspondent for the Washington Post, and I wrote a front page article. We felt good about it. We, it, was, it was the data were clear, it went from two thirds one way to two thirds the other, clear as day. Mark Penn, who was Clinton's pollster at the time and later chief strategist, you know, called to rip me a new one, you know, threatened me to you know, sanction me, you know, complain to me to APOR and uh, bring me up on ethics violations. I was super confident. I'm like, I can explain to you RDD. I can explain to you the methodology. I can explain to you the weighting. We feel good about it. It's right. Subsequently, every other poll showed the same thing. And, you know, the phone went cold for a little while. I was able to take that call because I knew the theory and I knew the practice, but did I also wish I had more than 114 black voters in my sample? Absolutely. And would I want to, would I, would I be as confident in answering a call from a Mark Penn today with 114 people in a cell? Absolutely not. You need scale both to solve the problem mathematically and to, you know, for your own confidence, I think. You need a reasonable sample with minimal self-selection. You just can't put links up and expect you're going to get good data. Y'all seen the Drudge Report surveys that they put up? I mean, you get what you pay for in that case, um, unless it's an ad and they paid too much for it. But the quality of the data is exceedingly low, or a CNBC survey, and there are you know, gobs of examples of those. But you also need a reasonable sample. I don't believe, as much as we have to model, the model can't be everything. Like, if you, like, there's a famous uh, piece about the kind of how do you model using Xbox sample, right? They can show in retrospect, they could have done well with a Xbox sample. Well, you know what? That's all model. I won't butcher too many metaphors, but let's say all hat, no cattle. Um, so, you know, it is, it's like, if you're just your model, you're just way out there and, you know, kind of, and it could work. You know what? It works until it doesn't. And that's a giant problem when it matters, something matters as much as polling. So I think you need something like, what is the root sample? Almost pre-weighted. I'm old school enough to, I like unweighted data. When I ask survey questions, you know, again, of randomly selected people, yes, using a pl particular platform, but I ask, you know, what's, you know, gender, you know, race, you know, age, just like I did on the telephone. And I get the data. It makes me feel better when those look like the sample I'm trying for that I don't have to weight everything. And so that, that's comforting. That's not a, that's a luxurious position today. You have to wait. So, but I like, we need a reasonable sample that's not just only modeled. And then you need transparency and expertise. And Elliot makes this strong case for transparency. That like that is the sine qua non of like getting started here. Like show us what you got, show us how you do it. You know, there used to be 20 questions of the National Council on Public Polls, which I don't think exists anymore, says journalists should ask. And they're all, super antiquated questions. But like I've been saying for years, ask one question. Why should I believe you? Take me from how you got your sample, the questions you asked, how you did your adjustment and the analysis. And then unfortunately, that's going to be an individual judgment about, you know, can I believe you because, and to be honest, a lot of pollsters could not answer that. They can't answer questions about their sample. They don't have the expertise on the modeling side. 
you know, and the and they're not unwilling to give you the details of the questionnaire. So you got to ask, but I, I think the answers are not going to be satisfying. We don't know a lot. I'll just pick on Ann Seltzer, famous pollster, A plus and five thirty eight. What was the one lesson from twenty sixteen that you wanted to share in your book about what how to do a poll? Sorry, not a test. Weight by education. Weight by education. Do you know what Ann Seltzer does not do? Weight by education. The one thing that if from a scientific perspective in polling that we know you absolutely have to do, this person who's held up on a pedestal, who I like quite a lot as a person, I love, and I love you, but if you're not waiting by education, you are not doing it, quote unquote, scientifically, you're doing it some other way. And that's we need to kind of get to the bottom of like, what is this? Um, that's my MVP. I look forward. I mean, it's against consensus. So we'll get out there and do it. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. I think all the speakers should now come up and face the music or face the audience. I just remember a line from Theo Key's book, Public Opinion in American Democracy, which is still very well worth reading for the students here, even though it's old. And he said, Searching for public opinion is like searching for the Holy Grail. It's a difficult enterprise. So floor is open for questions. Uh, you know, we're going to go a little beyond five o'clock before the wine and the food can entice us. So um, bring the wine in. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we could do that, Gracial. No, I'm just kidding. So questions from the floor. Anybody? <laughs> or comment you know, your 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 character in this book <laughs> as is Aaron I have a question oh, okay okay go ahead there is a question yeah okay. um okay um so you talked a lot about you know what happens once you get the data we sort of give up on, you know, we all raised our hands as who hasn't answered a survey. Who's working on the problem of that individual human response and why people aren't responding and what could be done to change that? Anybody looking at that part of the problem? Hopefully people in places like Berkeley. I mean, <laughs> pollsters don't have time for it, really. Journalists aren't doing it. There, there's a Aaron, couple. John? Yeah, so like NORC, the National Opinion Research Center. Center. Um, they do uh, for their for their panel. They do what's called a non-response follow-up uh, recruitment, uh, where they they do this super intense recruitment where they they like go to people. So it's, it's the it's the high cost version of what Mark was saying with following up with the text. They go to your door and yeah. they FedEx you something and they try and recruit them into to their panel with this super intense follow-up. But we've been studying some of their their non-response follow-up people. And I'd sort of hypothesize though that yeah. that if you look at trends, you know, people used to write memos and then emails and then Facebook posts and now tweets, that we have to look at that behavior and try to rethink how we interact with people looking at those societal behavioral changes, not trying to, you know, go to their door and do deeper dives because we know that's not how people are interacting and instead figure out how we can engage in a more contemporary way. I think that's right. So, I mean, I don't know if it's still true, but it used to be you said you could study non-voters by studying voters. Um, that may be less true in the survey context. But I mean, I think you can learn from asking people why they take surveys. And, you know, there's a Rutgers survey that I mentioned, Cliff Zukin, um, earlier, he did a survey in 2015 that just asked open-ended, why did you take the survey? And if you look at that, you know, it's, um, I, I, I was interested in what you called me about um, in the case of Rutgers, I think the fourth top no one thing was they liked the affiliation, so they trusted who was calling, and you mentioned that that came up earlier. Um, there was they were bored, you know, they had time. Um, only four percent, so like like thirteenth or fourteenth on the list was they care about the polls. It's like we can talk about how we care about the polls. People don't abstractly care about the polls. So, but it is like how are they spending their time? Where did you find them? You know, I think a lot of the problems with internet surveys today is that they're interfering with people's otherwise, you know, productive or non-productive activities. 
and kind of coming in this weird, like, what are you doing, you know, here? Whereas there are other contexts, including one, you know, that I do at SurveyMonkey, which is like piggybacking on another survey. Someone's already giving their opinion. You just ask for more detail. But I think it, 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 we need to know why people aren't doing it and how they can do better. That's the, I mentioned the task force report on, like there's a respondent's bill of rights that the task force is, uh, is pursuing. And kind of that's important because in, until you solve vanishing respondents, we can sit here at academic conferences for the next 50 years debating models. Uh, Terry and then Rick, go ahead, Terry. I almost feel like it's a tragedy of the commons that I get surveyed about, did you like your experience with this website? You know, it's like I get overly, overly surveyed. So I wonder if there could be some like organization that limited the number of surveys people get. <laughs> And that way you might get a higher response rate. I don't know if there's, if that's impossible to do politically. I don't know if Congress would be willing to have a hearing about that. <laughs> there, I mean, so we didn't really talk about this, but at the end of the book, there's a recommendation for APOR to sanction bad pollsters more often. So if one of the reasons why you, you might be, I don't know if you raised your hand earlier, when it was asked whether or not you respond to surveys or refuse surveys or nothing. One of the people, one of the reasons people say that is because they don't trust who's calling them or like they don't, or they're being push poll or they don't know what the information is being used for. So one thing APOR could do is mandate that that sort of information is disclosed at the beginning of a survey or before the, before the fact. And if you don't do that, then you're not accredited by them. And then if journalists get on board, then they're not covered, right? So this is sort of like, a pie sky solution. I mean, every, you can't put the genie back in the box. Right, and every marketing research company will tell you that you know big corporations out there are going to survey their customers after you buy a product or do a service. I mean, it's standard now. You're going to get questions about it, and maybe they're just bugging you, but that's what's going to happen. It, I don't see how you legislate that away. Rick? Yes, what is the impact of polling? What is the impact of polling on election results? In the sense that does in the, the sense that the well, we know about push polls and what their intention is, but with scientifically laid out polling, what influence does that polling have on election results? So is that a meta question? <laughs> I think it's a really good meta question. For, I mean, it does sound meta. The one study that's covered in the book is the study by some scientists that sorry here let me speak into this there's a study on this by some political scientists at dartmouth and elsewhere who answered the question of election forecasts influence behavior if you see an election forecast will you be less likely to turn out to vote if that election forecast says you know some candidate has a 99 percent chance to win or something and that does find some effects now I mean, this is getting into the weeds about how the study is conducted. I'm not sure if I buy the magnitude of the effects or what have you, but that certainly suggests that this is something that people should be researching. There's a new study that shows people are more likely to adopt beliefs that are presented to them as consensus beliefs. So there would there could be a bandwagon effect here, but as far as the book's perspective, this is pretty much an unanswered. Well, Rick, this is an old issue. Remember when there was all of this concern that if the polls closed in the East Coast before while Californians were still voting and people knew the result, it would lower turnout because people say, why should I vote? The results are already known. And in some European countries, they don't allow polls to be published in the last week or few days before the election on the assumption that that prediction will affect either turnout or how people behave. So yeah, I, I don't think we know systematically the answer to your question, but there certainly seems to be some evidence that there's, you know, some kind of effect here. Of course, we allow polling up to the minute, right, of be midnight the day before the election, you're going to get the latest result. On the other hand, of course, we have early voting, which I think is an absurd phenomenon. Myself, even though people say, Reducing the number of early voting days is some, you know, subterranean attack on, on democracy. But what make you know if you vote, you know, you could vote today 
I think, 30 days before the election? And, you know, does it help democracy if voters vote before the last month in which significant significant events could occur? I mean, so, you know, there are lots of uh, ways in which the rules, uh, uh, you know, the rules have an impact on, uh, on outcomes, and that's one of them. I mean, part of the question is, do expectations matter? Yeah. Right? Because like there would be expectations without the polls. Yeah. And, you know, kind of the questions are, do those polls, well done polls, you know, kind of improve people's expectations, you know, kind of in the direction that's what matters. Because like people make predictions without polls. And then you have the, all the precision that the forecasters put on top of that. But I mean, I think there's several instances where the lack of polls, you know, could have made a difference. Yeah. You know, if you look at 2016. Lewis, Susie? 2016, probably. 2016. I mean, you talk about this in the book, yeah. right? Like, like that, the, the, the certainty of the forecast, I mean, there will people who will go to their graves believing that the certainty of the forecast led enough people not to vote in Michigan, you know, Wisconsin right, right. and Pennsylvania to turn that election. No, no, sorry. I'm arguing the opposite. The opposite. I'm thinking that a well-calibrated forecasting model from 2016 with a 70% chance of a, of a Hillary Clinton victory was much less than you would have inferred by reading the New York Times coverage about the election. True, I also I also agree with that. Yeah. I was going to make the point about the third Bloomberg term in New York, where the New York Times decided not to poll, and it ended up being pretty close, right? If the New York Times polls and it's close, do more people turn out? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. right. Like the, the the entire assumption, the entirety of the New York Times coverage of Bloomberg's reelection campaign was it was not a camp race, and it turned out to be a pretty slender, you know, contest, would an accurate poll that showed, hey, this is worth voting in, you know, met, led to not record low turnout, potentially. So it's like, it's all about the expectations and like, and the coverage of it is often biased more from the lack of polling than the existence of polling, at least high quality. Yeah. Um, Susie, yeah. Thanks, this is super interesting. Um, so we talked a lot about polls in the context of election polls, which is nice because you get to see the run the election and, and see how you did. When we think about issue polls, do we have any sense of what the extent of error, what the sources are, and if we're dealing with the same problems and the magnitude? So if you have a Pew poll that says, you know, X percent of people think this about abortion, Aaron? what are the sources of error there? Well, I mean, I think John had the Nice, the nice plot that showed that for issues. But but I think that the thing to think about is, so when we think about bias in these surveys, we can mathematically decompose it. And it's a function of, so we had something we forgot to include, something that we didn't measure, something we didn't include in our weights. And the question is, is that thing balanced? Like, do we have a representative sample? Probably not. And is it correlated with the thing that we care about? How well does that thing predict our outcome? And I think with election polling, because partisanship is such a strong predictor in the US, any sort of differential response by partisanship causes a lot of bias. But as I think what drives a lot of that plot is that those things, the things that we have that inform whether or not you respond to a survey are not so strongly correlated with these issues we care about. And I think that's why there's a bit more hope there. Um, but I think it would depend on the issue. How correlated is that issue with partisanship? Is it, a, is it, is it got a strong cleavage? Um, and if so, I think part of the, what we saw with the vaccination is related to that because vaccination was pretty related to partisanship. So it depends on the issue, but the way what to think about is how well could I predict that thing with the things I think are correlated with whether or not you respond? I worry about, uh, similarly, I worry about things that are outside the political domain more than inside the political domain, in part because, you know, we know the major bias is on education and who responds to a survey. And highly correlated with that, but slightly different, is volunteerism. Like, still taking a poll, no matter how you take it, is a, a voluntary act. And there is a bias for people who volunteer in other areas to also volunteer to take a survey. And to the extent that that's correlated, and you can go through all, the, start to go through issues that matter less, or demographics that matter less, is why you need data to wait. But you then you have that, so the difference on the Pew poll for uh, some things is one or two, goes to 10, or, you know, kind of on the air, on the things that kind of were volunteerism matter, or civic engagement matters. And the part where this kind of, kind of overlaps into politics is if people who weren't, weren't ordinarily involved in civic life 
all of a sudden vote, they're missed because that's their one expression. They don't participate in the rest. One, so the chances of error are bigger. One thing I took away from one of our last polls, and it just kind of exemplifies how the extreme partisan uh, nature of our politics today is, is manifesting itself. I mean, we were asking about Governor Newsom's proposal on, uh, you know, the zero emissions uh, law that he is now the goal for 2035 uh, to have zero, uh, you know, new sales of, of gasoline engines. And we asked in the survey question, um, you know, thinking about your next purchase of a new vehicle, whether it's a car or truck, what type of vehicle would you buy? And, you know, we had the different types. Uh, and what was struck me was it correlated exactly with their feelings toward the law, which meant that the Democrats were very likely to buy electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. And the Republicans were still saying, no, no, I'm going to buy a gas vehicle. So it, to me, that was revealing. I mean, I was used to do a lot of research for companies. If I were an auto company, I'd start investigating the political background of the auto buyer because it seemed in our poll very correlated with what they're going to buy. And I, I think it's a very powerful thing in, in politics. It's, it's going into where you live. It's, uh, it's just going into all facets of life. I've never seen this before. So, Does the voter file know if you're buying a Tesla? <laughs> I mean, maybe I don't. I don't know. Or, or, don't or is it? Or is it now. because in the context of a political survey where you've just answered this question, yeah. like you answer other questions that are political? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't know the answer. Like, I would say that you look at the density of Teslas, and if you look where they are in California, they're in Marin County, and it's extremely liberal. I think there's correlation, but you know, I don't think it's just false testimony. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Elon might change that. We'll see. Gracial, do you want to ask a question? Question. Okay, um, you get to ask the last question since you organized this event <laughs> and you, yes. you have the wine waiting out there. We are so. waiting for all of you. Also, really yummy food. Um, sure. I just had a question in regards to um, the finding that you found that there was a strong correlation between what the Democrats and the conservatives purchased um, based on the question of governing Newsom's um, new law. I was just wondering, um, based on like just personal anecdotes completely, from my understanding, liberals tend to gravitate more towards those eco-friendly options to begin with. So I'm just wondering, was there any way to control for kind of this perception that I have going on um, as in relation to um, Governor Newsom's law? Like to say that maybe the liberals were already going to purchase eco-friendly vehicles. It just so happened that this question was the frame the way that it was. Well, I don't know. I mean, we were the, the main purpose of putting the questions on the poll was to get reaction to the governor's new legislation. It was getting national attention. We wanted to see how Californians felt. And it was highly correlated with their politics. I mean, that was the, the bottom line. Democrats, liberals, strongly 80 percent plus supportive of the law, Republicans 30 plus less uh, against. And, uh, you know, and then to me, again, one of the more surprising things was just their in purchase intentions, which came later. But uh, weaving the two together. Well, I just bought a gas, gas powered car. And I don't, and I, I didn't vote for Trump. I don't love Newsom though. So I don't know, you know, yeah. it was the only car available, you know, when I wanted to buy a car <laughs> and it cost a lot less than They're electric power. Back up on the mic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> OK, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I want to just conclude one point. M my own career and the career of a lot of my colleagues in the uh, American political behavior, political behavior world, we would not have careers if it were not for surveys. We would, I would not have a career without ANES, NORC, GSS, uh, SurveyMonkey, the and the field poll. Oh, I wasn't going to forget you, Mark, believe me. And I do think that when we, you know, we don't dig deeply when we do these, our analyses and write our articles and books, we do not dig deeply into the quality of the polls because that would uh, be another barrier on writer's block. I mean, you would never publish anything, right? <laughs> You're worrying too much about that kind of thing. But of course, everything that was said about improving the quality of polls matters matters for the new generation of people who are going to do public opinion research. 
And maybe we were lucky to have done all this writing in the golden age, right? You know, I don't, didn't think about it that way, but you know, there it is. Anyway, thank everyone for coming. Thanks the audience. Thanks the people here. And please continue talking while you refresh yourself.